Uh, welcome to any who are joining with us in uh, isolating at home still, and welcome to everyone here. My name's Brenda McLaughlin. I'm the Senior Minister here at Irwin Anglican. And I thought I'd start with a joke. Uh, it's a joke about a minister, Pastor John. And Pastor John woke up one Sunday morning to find it was an exceptionally beautiful and sunny early spring day, and he said to himself, I just have to go and play golf. Now, he wasn't down to preach that day, so he rang his assistant and chucked a sickie and uh, asked his assistant to cover for him. As soon as he got the phone, though, straight in the car, he drives out of town some 40 miles to a golf club a couple of, uh, a couple of towns over. He, he knew he didn't want to accidentally meet anyone from his parish. Well, St. Peter was watching this from up in heaven, and St. Peter leans over to the Lord and says, Hey, are you going to let this guy get away with this? And God sighs and says, no, I guess not. And so Pastor John sets up at the first hole. It's a par four, 260 metres. And he just clocks it. It is his best drive ever. And the ball flies straight down the fairway, lands about 15 metres before the, the green rolls up onto the green, into the hole for a hole in one on a par four. And St Peter's like... I cannot believe you just let him do that. You are blessing him for skipping church. And God just smiles and says, am I? I mean, like, who's he going to tell? Well, I tell that story because we're looking at the topic of church today, uh, in particular, how church is one of the main ways that God blesses his people. Now, for those who don't know this, uh, blessing people is God's modus operandi. He loves blessing people. In fact, if you ever wanted to understand how God relates to humans in the Bible, you only need to remember two words, and it is grace and response. All right? Grace and response. So firstly, God loves to pour out his grace. Now, by grace, we mean unmerited goodness and blessing. He loves to pour out his grace on people. I mean, in fact, that's why he made us in the first place. Because he wanted to share his grace, his goodness. However, grace requires a response. And that response that we are to give is obedience. Uh, if humans disobey God, we are told to expect God's curse instead of his blessing. But curse is not God's preference. Right? God would much rather bless us. And he does so in many, many different ways. But what we're going to see today is how being a member of the local church... And coming along to church every Sunday is arguably the main way in which God blesses his people, save for the cross itself. And what this means is, if we miss church, then we're actually missing the main source that God wants to bless us with this week. And I have three points to help us see this, as your sermon outline shows on the inside of your new sheet. So uh, to understand how much of a blessing church is, we want to be, I want to begin by looking at God's curses today. Uh, so to properly understand blessing, we need to understand the opposite of blessing. And so our first point is titled, How God Curses People. We're then going to look at the basics of how God blesses people in our second point, And we're going to conclude by seeing how the church fits into all this. Okay, uh, so I've titled our third point, How the Church Blesses People. For, but our goal for today is to see how you and I can get the maximum blessing God has on offer for us this week. And so if that's something that you think is worth looking into, then please stick with me as we look at how God curses people, how God blesses people, and how the church blesses people. And uh, we want to begin... So if we want to understand how much of a blessing the church is, we first need to see exactly how God curses people. Now, this might seem like a weird place to start, but please uh, stick with me, bear with me, because if we, if we better understand how God curses people, that will help us see how uh, better as to how God blesses people. But as we do this, I just want to say up front that God's justice requires that he punishes people for their crimes. 
I mean, that's just the general principle of justice. We hear about miscarriages of justice from time to time, don't we? Uh, when someone gets let off lightly for a heinous crime. Well, friends, God will not open himself up to the charge of miscarrying justice. But because he is a, uh, in order for him to be a perfectly just and righteous God, he must punish people for their sins. And whenever God punishes people in the Bible, whenever God curses people for their disobedience in the Bible, he does so by sending them away from him. We need to understand this, okay? To be cursed by God in the Bible is to be scattered away from him. So I'll give you an example. Adam and Eve, all right? Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, God cursed them. Now, there are a number of punishments handed down in Genesis chapter 3, but they culminated in Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. All right? He sent them away from the place where they could meet with God face to face. Another example, when Cain kills his brother Abel, what happens? God curses him. And he curses him by sending him away. I just want to read one verse. Uh, this is Genesis 4 verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. Right? Cain was being hidden from God's presence. Or then there's the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. When the humans tried to usurp God by building a tower to the heavens, God cursed them. And how did he curse them? By mixing up their languages. And we read this. This is Genesis 11 verse 8. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. And one final example, the nation of Israel. So Israel responded to God's covenant love by continually disobeying God's laws. And after hundreds of years of patience, God cursed them. And how did he do that? In the exile. He sent them away from the promised land. So friends, I want us to understand this. Whenever God curses someone in the Bible, he does so by scattering them, by sending them away from him. And friends, that's what hell is as well, isn't it? All right? Those who continue in their rebellion against God, rather than turn to God in repentance and faith, God will scatter them away from him for good one day. All right? Hell is an eternity of being separated from God's goodness. So that's the first thing I want us to understand today. When God punishes people for their sin, uh, when God curses people for their disobedience, he sends them away from him. Now, the reason I want us to understand this is because when God wants to bless people in the Bible, he does the opposite of that. Uh, whenever God blesses people, he gathers them to himself. So, another example, uh, part of the blessing of Eden was being able to hang out with God each day, to be able to walk with him in the garden each day. When God blesses the nation of Israel in the Exodus, what does he do? He gathers them at Mount Sinai. Israel got to see the incredible glory of God descend on the mountain and hear God speaking himself as he gave them the Ten Commandments. No one else has ever experienced that blessing to this day. Uh, the way God blessed people, uh, Israel, after Sinai was in the tabernacle or later on the temple. Okay, God blessed Israel by allowing them to gather around him in a very special way that none of the other nations were allowed to do. And so when God curses people in the Bible, what does he do? He sends them away from himself. When God blesses people in the Bible, he draws them to himself. He gathers them around himself. And the reason for this is really simple. God is the source of all goodness in the universe, right? Everything that is good and right and praiseworthy and enjoyable in existence comes from God. And so what that means is the closer you are to God, the more you get to enjoy that goodness. It's kind of like a, a campfire on a really bitter cold winter's night. The further away from the campfire you are, the more cold and miserable you get, don't you? So how does the church fit into all this? Well, the English word church, I don't know if you know this or not, the English word church translates the Greek word ecclesia. And ecclesia simply means gathering. 
But it's not any old gathering. It's not like when we gather at the bowling club or we gather for a rello bash. All right? Church is gathering around Jesus. What did Jesus say? This is Matthew 18, 20. For when two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Church is a gathering of Christians who have come together specifically to worship the Lord. And what this means is church is God blessing his people. Now, it's vitally important that we understand this point, right? If you only take one thing away from today, this is all I want you to take away, okay? The church does not exist to make disciples of all nations, as some people claim. Now, that's a good thing. The church should be doing that. But the church's mission is not to make disciples of all nations. The church's mission is simply to be a blessing to believers. Let me say that again. The reason the church exists, the reason God invented the church in the first place, is purely and simply to bless believers. Now, we're going to see how church blesses believers in a few moments in our third point. <clears throat> but please understand this. When we miss church for a week, we are missing the greatest blessing the highest good and the deepest enjoyment that God has to offer us this week. I mean, think about it. What is the greatest blessing God can give? Let me tell you, it's not the latest blockbuster movie or stage show. It's not the latest smartphone or gadget. The greatest blessing God can give is not a promotion or more money. It's not more likes on social media or finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend who loves me. Right? Now, they are good things, and we can enjoy those things, but they're not our ultimate thing. All right? Our ultimate treasure, and our, our vision statement says this, is God. And coming to church means gathering with the people of God around our ultimate treasure. Okay, Church is the high point of a Christian's worship for the week. That means church is the greatest blessing, the highest good, and the deepest enjoyment God has to offer us each week. Now, here's the thing. The only reason a sane person would miss out on that is if they don't yet understand how it is they're being blessed at church. All right, so if you don't enjoy church and you don't see church as the enormous blessing that God says it is, well, maybe it's the church's fault, all right? Maybe there's something wrong with the church. We can't go past that. But God knows the church isn't perfect. All right, so maybe the reason we don't enjoy church the way God wants us to is because we don't yet understand how to extract God's blessing from the church. So that's what I want to do with our third and final point today. Let's look at how God uses the church to bless people. And for this, we turn to our passage today. I know it's very late in the piece to be turning to our passage, uh, but this is a doctrinal sermon, so we've been looking at passages all over the Bible so far, haven't we? But in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul tells us two very important things. He tells us, number one, how God blesses people through the church, and number two, how to get that blessing. Uh, now, this is not the only way that God blesses the church. There are many, many different ways that God blesses us through the church. But in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul gives us what I think is probably the biggest blessing. Okay? Uh, and, and, and the way to get it. So, uh, what is the main way? Well, let's read uh, chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Where is it? So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, first, what is the blessing? It is that the body of Christ, okay, that's the church, may be built up, verse 12. But what does that mean? Well, to be built up, means to reach maturity, verse 13. But it's not physical maturity like going through puberty, okay? It's spiritual maturity. 
which is described as attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, friends, that phrase alone is enough to warm the heart, isn't it? Attaining to the fullness of the whole measure of Christ. But here's the thing. What it means is even more glorious than how it sounds. And what it means is emulating Christ's characteristics. It means becoming the kind of people we all want to be. I heard a... uh, uh, an interview with Chris Evans a few years ago. Now, Chris Evans plays Captain America in the Marvel uh, movies. I have a bit of an unhealthy man crush on him. Uh, but uh, when he was being interviewed about Captain America, he said, Captain America is the man I want to be. Friends, how much more should we want to be like Christ and have his characteristics? Because he doesn't have any bad characteristics, does he? And so attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ means becoming less irritable, less anxious. It means being less envious, less proud and conceited, and less judgmental. Do they sound like good things to you? It means being more patient, more kind, more generous, more honest, more forgiving. Right? Are you seeing the blessings that comes from being more like Jesus? It means being a better listener, more servant-hearted, slower to anger, more courageous, and of course, more loving. The main way God uses the church to bless us is by transforming us into the kind of men and women we all want to be. And that is the kind of men and women God wants us to be. These are men and women who attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the blessing you get from coming to church. The second thing Paul shows us is how to get it. And there are two things we need, and they're seen in verses 11 and 12. Let me read them again. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So firstly, uh, he has given the church certain gifts, certain people, whose specific task is to prepare God's people to attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, who are those people? Well, we don't have apostles anymore. Uh, They died out in the first century. We don't have many prophets. I haven't met one yet. Uh, There's not many prophets around these days. We do have evangelists still, like the late, great Billy Graham. And we do have pastors and teachers. They're your ministers, right? But every one of these people has been given by God for the specific job of preparing God's people. And they do that by bringing the word of God to bear on their lives. Okay, so my main job as a minister is to proclaim God's word so that you can see him more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly. And that last one is is attaining to the fullness of Christ, right? So when you come to church each week, if you switch off during the sermon or start thinking about your shopping list or whispering to the person next to you, uh, you're actually missing out on God's blessing. What that means is you are risking church being a colossal waste of time for you that week. Right? We come here to learn about God and that is the first way that we get blessed by God. Second way we receive that blessing is what ministers are preparing us for. So what does it say? Uh, Verse 12, to equip his people for works of service. Ministers are to equip people, raise them up and release them so that they can then serve the church with their God-given gifts. So what that means is we have input and output. So we get the input from God's word, hearing about God's word, learning about God, and we have the output of works of service. It's just like a person cannot hope to get fit by sitting on the couch all day we're watching Netflix, can they? Uh, Christians also cannot attain the full measure uh, of the fullness of Christ by simply warming a pew on Sunday. 
Right? If you're not serving your Christian brothers here at Earlwood Anglican, then dare I say it, you are risking yet again church being a bit of a waste of time for you. All right? The blessing of church is input, hearing God's word, and output, serving uh, like works of service. It's right there in verse 12. But here's the thing. There's a catch. I'm sorry to do this to you. Uh, there's a catch. Here's the thing. If we only listen to the sermon and only serve others because we want that blessing, then we don't actually get the blessing. All right. Remember the, 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 the verse in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If we are only giving because we want the blessing, we don't actually get the blessing. And the reason being, we're only doing those things for ourselves, aren't we? So that we'll get blessed. And God has set up the universe in such a way that that kind of selfishness never gets blessed. Uh, the universe conforms to God's character. okay? And God's character is not to love people in order so that he can get blessed. He loves people just so that he can love people. I'll explain it this way. Forgive me if you've heard this story before, uh, but it's about a young handmaiden. Picture a young handmaiden uh, who is serving her queen and loves her queen very much. And one day she comes to her queen and gives her a beautiful hand-embroidered handkerchief. Uh, she's poor. She's just a handmaiden, but she says, uh, Dearest queen, this is a small token of my love and, and, and appreciation of you. And the queen sees right into this handmaiden's heart and sees her dedication to her. And so what she does is she promotes her to chief handmaiden and she gives her the quarters right next to hers. But the queen's niece notices this and thinks to herself, man, if this young handmaiden gets that kind of blessing from a handkerchief, imagine what I could get if I gave uh, the queen my by diamond encrusted bracelet and so she does that but the queen again sees right into that niece's heart and she says oh thank you and goes to leave but seeing the pain and anguish in her niece's uh, her niece's eyes she stops and she says listen dear girl the reason I promoted my handmaiden is because she gave me the most precious thing she owned what you've done is you are giving to yourself, aren't you? The way to be truly blessed by church is to serve not in order to get blessed, but simply because we love Jesus. And our love comes from seeing him loving us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, brothers and sisters, when we see the depths of Jesus' love for us in dying for our sins, it makes us want to see him more every Sunday. And seeing Jesus' love more clearly then makes us love him more dearly and then follow him more nearly through our works of service. Friends, I pray that you will see church as not just another blessing that God has poured out on his people, Right? It is the high point of his blessing for his people this week. It is the high point of his blessing overall, I think, save for the cross of itself. And I pray that we see this. I pray that when we see this, we will ensure that not even wild horses will drag us away from church come Sunday. And I pray that we will actually be inviting others to enjoy this blessing too. May Christians not selfishly keep this blessing to ourselves. Because God loves to bless his people. And he's done so first and foremost in the cross, and second in the blessing that is the church.